Do you have a better side? I don't know. What do you think? No, no, so no. you do this one right okay. here. <laughs> so you do. Yeah. Um, uh, and are you dressed in Gap clothes today? You really ask that question seriously? Yes, yeah. I'm dressed in Gap clothes. Yeah. Not my shoes, but everything else. That's and you? good. No, I think it's Joseph Banks, if I'm, uh, but, okay. but that's not important. Uh, so, so we're going to talk about shared value in a minute, but I, but I want to talk a little bit about your business first, because th the last decade has been a tough time for retail in general and a, and a particularly tough time for Gap. Uh, uh, so can you talk a little bit about the restructuring you're doing and why you're having to do it and where you see this headed? I'm happy to. Um, this is good rehearsal because we have our earnings call coming up and things like that. So thanks for giving me this opportunity. Good. We, we put a few analysts in the audience. So this is, uh, um, I might exit now. Um, <laughs> this is the 50th year of the company. So Gap was started as a brand in 1969. And what really is taking place inside the company against the backdrop of a very difficult retail environment, but nonetheless an environment where people are winning and including a number of businesses in our portfolio. Um, I finally made a decision I was not going to be the CEO to kick the can down the road and we're closing several hundred stores. And we're closing them because in all of you here, really in all parts of the world, can probably note a mall that used to be the place to be and a place to shop that is no longer relevant anymore. And so what it really comes down to is closing a lot of stores to pivot to places, whether it's online or in other locations, whether it's selling wholesale, um, to pivot to places where customers are shopping today versus maybe 20 or 30 years ago. But just to stay on that for a second, you're closing what, 200 and? Close to 300. Close to 300 yep. stores. You're not opening 300 stores someplace else. Uh, I am opening a significant number of stores, yeah. In Gap Brand, we're closing stores, but then in other brands we're opening, and then I've got a little side project where we're opening stores in a very different uh, format for Gap Brand as well. And so far, really strong returns. In this I, I mean, there was there was a period when people talked about the coming of Amazon would bring about a retail apocalypse. It's, it's not quite an apocalypse, but it's kind of uncomfortable, isn't it? 200, um, 300 stores is not a small thing. 300 stores is not a small thing. That is correct. Is it uncomfortable? Um, it's actually not in a way because where I come back, and it's a bit, I think, like your business where. Uh, I suspect you're selling a lot. If it's a bit like my business, you are in lot, big trouble. A lot fewer magazines than you used to sell back in the day, but you are reaching customers through different channels and different mediums uh, and different formats. And that's kind of the way I think about our business as well. Gap brand we know around the world, and let's focus on Gap, is an incredibly strong brand. You know, as I was walking around Boston this weekend, I saw a lot of Gap Arch hoodies that people were wearing. Um, we're not meeting them in places that we need to be. And so to me, a lot of it is about how do we monetize the brand more effectively and meet our customers where they're shopping. And, and why is it important to split off, you're splitting Gap, Banana Republic, and so forth from Old Navy? Why is that a smart thing to do? And the so forth is important because we're a company, many of you may not know, of seven brands now. And we're splitting Old Navy from the portfolio of the six brands. And we're really splitting Old Navy, um, mostly because it has different business needs than the rest of the company. It has a specific format. It's a big box format, locations in certain places. We believe that there's a chance to well more than increase the business by 50 to 75% through additional store growth. It's uh, an incredible um, business model, but it does have bus different business needs relative to the other brands in the portfolio. And I invest Alan, I invest close to a billion dollars a year, largely in fulfillment and other aspects of technology. And that's really where the di divergence between the businesses comes from at the end of the day. Hmm. In-store, um, back of house, the fulfillment promise, and a number of those areas. And a higher-end brand like a Banana Republic or an Athleta or a Janie and Jack or an Intermix, they're really meeting their customer in a very different way than a value apparel, sh a value apparel shopper is shopping. And your but Old Navy is making money. Uh, we're making money in a lot of places, and Old Navy is making money. That but you're, you're, you're staying, in, in some sense, you're staying with the challenge businesses. I am staying where I think there's going to be a ton of fun. <laughs> re no, I'm very serious, because my board actually said, what do you want to do as we're going down yeah. this? And the first thing they said, which I was thankful for, what's the average CEO tenure? I'm probably coming up to that cliff right now. They said, we're not going to go down this path unless you're in art. And I was happy about that. Where do you want to be in? And I said, I want to be in to re really reinvent this new Gap Inc. 
for the next 50 years. Yeah. So it's going to be fun. Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm glad that was a great background. And I think it's important to have that background because in some sense, shared value is an easy thing to do if you're running a software platform that's printing money or a network business that's bringing money hand over fist and say, yeah, we'll share some of the value that's here. Correct. It's a much tougher thing to do when you're struggling as much as, as Gap has been struggling over the last decade. So. How does shared value play into this transformation that you have to do? Can I tell you a secret? It's actually not difficult. And that's really, I, I want to underline that because we started this uh, really probably in, when I joined the company back in 2005, 2006. And we stared at what I believe is a false dichotomy. And that is that shared value comes at a cost, not at a return. And uh, I am a big believer, and we have proven out now through a number of different things that we have done in the company, that the interests of the shareholders are aligned with the interests of the communities that we do business in. Happy to spend some time on those, but I, am, I'm, I think if it is, in fact, painted on on top, and it comes at a cost, just as we've seen in politics, when the new administration comes in, priorities can Goes. change. Absolutely. But you feel you've embedded it in the business. Want a few examples? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. That's, are you, um, you're asking my questions. You're making it easy for me. <laughs> so this way ahead, it's a good example. This way ahead is a commitment that we started about 10 years ago where we are focused on um, job and life skills for at-risk youth in the communities that we do business in. And this way ahead has proven to be exceptional also as a way to bring entry-level talent into our retail stores to the point where we've committed that with about 130,000 employees in our stores all over the place, around the world, we've committed to about 5% to bring in 5% of our entry level employees through the This Way Ahead program. Wow. Why is it good? It is good for the communities. We need to invest in youth at every place along the, along the spectrum. Why is it good for us? Lower turnover, um, they stay with the company longer, they advance faster, they're committed employees, um, and so So that 5% is better than your average? It is better than the average employee we're hiring off the street. That is correct. It's just completely cost-effective program. Completely cost-effective program. Let me go to another example. We started the PACE program roughly the same time. The PACE program is about bringing life, health, financial job, and reproductive skills to the women that work in the factories of our vendors around the world. And with independent audit, after we brought it in, and some of our vendors were very reluctant to bring this curriculum into the factories, we independently audited it, and we still do on an ongoing basis. And we find, again, those women have lower turnover. They have advanced now, many of them, into the ranks of management. Um, they are more productive in the, work, in the business, and we have vendors that are, that are aggressively committed, now taking the ball from us and running with this, or from the NGO, aggressively committed to rolling this out across their what, factories. What does the program do? How does the program work? The program is a, is a curriculum, and it's a classroom setting, and it is taught through uh, NGO partners that we work with in different countries around the world, and it teaches women um, basic financial skills, helps them become, become banked, which a lot of them aren't in do the Do they do this during work hours? They do this uh, on, the, on the, it depends on the, on the vendor, but it's typically done during the work hours and the vendor, our vendor partners are the ones that are providing the space, providing the facilities, and that kind of thing. And again, demonstrably Demonstrably, by outside independent audit, these, these workers are more productive. And again, we, we are, I'm so convicted about the need for that to be the case because some of our vendors began to do this simply because they wanted to do business with us, and PACE came as part of it. Now they have taken it and they are running with it. And that's what is sustainable. They believe in it as something that is good for their business. Yeah. Other examples? I've got one more. Okay, good. So Gap Inc., um, this is on the sustainability side. We consume about 1% of the global cotton crop every year. We are, which is a big number if you think about 1%. Um, our brands tend to be cotton focused. We're not a, we don't, we, we believe in a cotton hand. Um, cotton overall, we are a big supporter and participant in the Better Cotton Initiative, but cotton overall is not a great crop for the planet. It is water intensive, it is herbicide and pesticide intensive, and it competes for arable land that it can otherwise be used for food production often. So when I came into this role, I looked at that, having experienced also a commodity crisis with cotton in 2011 where cotton prices spiked and it had an impact on our economics. 
I ask, how much cotton gets recycled? And the answer is none, basically. Some of it gets ripped apart and blown into insulation. Most of it goes uh, into a landfill or it's burned, et cetera. So it was impossible to recycle cotton, and I got all of the reasons why, that it's, uh, the hand feels not the same, the hue's not the same, the tensile strength of the fabric won't be the same. Uh, in the fall season coming up in Gap Brand, we'll be introducing denim that is indistinguishable from virgin cotton denim, where we have a 5% post-consumer waste cotton content in it. We believe that ultimately we can get that to probably 30%. And the important thing is it's immediately cost neutral. We believe that can be cost advantaged over time. Doesn't cost you any it additional. Doesn't cost us any additional. Amazing. All, all right, so let's, the first two examples you gave were employee examples. They were. And you said they increase loyalty. They, they make your, your employees stick with you longer. More productive, stick longer, yes, exactly. Uh, and, and we hear this a lot, I hear this a lot from CEOs, that it's the, that the, it's the employees are the, the strongest force often behind shared value. But the third one you gave was a, was a consumer example. Uh, it's cost effective, so why not do it? Does it make any difference to the consumer? And when I say any difference, willing to pay more, willing to buy more? So my experience has been that um, sustainability, values, et cetera, it's kind of a gift with purchase. Um, and, and the simple example I say is if the, the clothes, if the pair of jeans isn't on trend, the hand isn't great, it doesn't fit you well, uh, you're not going to buy it because... Just because it's you're recyclable. Not. <laughs> you're not. Yeah. And so the entire focus here, and, and I, this was really interesting getting this through the organization because organizations clutch on to what they know. The entire focus here was to push it through and make it cost neutral and to a consumer make it absolutely indistinguishable from the best denim that they could buy that was made from virgin fiber. But it, you don't see it as a huge marketing benefit. I see it as... Um, I see it as a huge marketing benefit. And the reason for that is that I believe we're at right now with the new generation of consumers coming in, I do believe, and we can see this now as we work through our market research and spend time in our stores, where people are willing to vote with their dollars as long as it is benefit neutral, is the way that I would describe it, okay? If I can buy that pair of jeans that is on trend, that fits me well, that has the right wash and the right novelty, and it comes with values I align with, You'll and it pay doesn't more. Cost, no, I will pay the same, but it's a market share opportunity. I'm yeah, not okay. going to pay more. But I, you'll, you'll win the sale. I will win the sale over time, absolutely. We found this because Athleta, one of our, our big growth brands, is, a, is B Corp certified. Yeah. And um, our customers respond to it. First of all, they say, well, what's B Corp certification? We educate them that there is a huge customer response to the fact that that, but again, it has to be the right product first. It has to be the right product on trend, all those words that I attach to it that I've learned over the last 14 years in the company of selling apparel. Yeah, and how about your investors? I mean, how often do you go and sit down with them? Well, on the earnings call tomorrow, how many of them are gonna ask about the three programs you- It's not tomorrow, don't get out in front of us, <laughs> otherwise I'll have people calling our IR department. Um, none. Never. Never. Doesn't come up. Doesn't come up. So this notion that investors have sort of gotten into the shared value story does not resonate I've with you I've listened yet. to it. I've challenged our IR department to find where these investors are. They may be <laughs> investing in other sectors. They're not standing on the sidelines and looking into retail or apparel right now. You think, we'll, have, you think we'll ever get there? That is a, that's almost a, it's almost a philosophical question, I think, at the end of the day. I think that... Clearly, if I can demonstrate that these, these what, whatever you call them, the things we're doing, deliver um, consistently better business outcomes that impact our economics, then they'll, then they'll absolutely value them. Yeah. But, they, but today, no, I've never been asked in now four and a half years of buy side and sell side meetings, I've never once been asked about, about this aspect of what yeah. we're doing. Yeah, but you do it because it's the right thing for your business, and as you describe it, it's so clearly the right thing for your business. It makes me wonder why this is so difficult. Why isn't everybody seeing what you're seeing? You know, I can't speak. I can't speak for other businesses. What I can speak is uh, is to the the resistance that large organizations have to doing anything different, Alan. I think at the end of the day, and that's been the super interesting thing to me about this recycled denim the recycled denim initiative that we have, I literally had to ultimately, because I was being told that it doesn't feel the same, 
it doesn't have the same hue. Um, and I wasn't, didn't even know I was looking for hue when I was looking at denim. So we finally did literally a blind consumer test and it showed exactly what it showed, which was no consumer can tell the difference at the end of the yeah, day. Yeah. And, um, and that was enough. And I just said, at this point, I had to just say, fine, we're going to do this. I want this in our stores by fall and made it happen. And it's not because anyone is badly intended. It's organizations are deeply patterned to do what they know how to do. So the biggest enemy of shared value is inertia. I think in our, in my company, I can only speak locally. I think it is a huge impediment to overcome to get the organization to think differently. And Fascinating, I'm sure that's a, a lot of people share that experience in this room. Yeah. Well, uh, t I know you put a lot of attention on issues. Of, we've, there's been a lot of talk over the last few days of issues of equity, diversity, fair pay, all of those things. Can you talk a little bit about what you've done in that area? So I would love to say what I've done. Let me tell you what we are because, um, so we are 100% pay equal. And this goes down to the factories that we do business in, many of which are obviously in developing countries. We audit our vendors. Um, we're not perfect, um, but inside, the, inside of the, our four walls, we're 100% pay equal across gender, across race, across sexual orientation. I would love to say I did that. I inherited that. That has been the culture that has existed inside this company as best I can tell back for close to 50 years when Don and Doris Fisher founded the company. Um, we are quite diverse. We're 80% female as an organization. 75% of my senior operating executives are female. Our stores uh, very consistently represent the population and diversity, racial composition of the communities that we do business in. And again, you could say why. Uh, I did ask Doris Fisher why we were pay equal. And what she did was she looked at me and she said, why wouldn't you be pay equal if you want to attract the best people who contribute to the full extent of their abilities and can succeed to the full extent of their capabilities, wouldn't you pay them the same? <laughs> it seems kind of a duh when you actually hear it said that way, doesn't it? But it's, a, it's great pride, and I go back to the split. So we are splitting off Old Navy and standing up a new Fortune 5, I can say that, you're Fortune 500, right? New Fortune 500 corporation, and it will be led by a diverse woman and I'm very proud to say that in all the conversations that we had inside my boardroom, and you can imagine what those conversations were when you're splitting up a company that's been together for 50 years, never once did it come up that she was a diverse female. The conversation was around right leader for the right place at the right time. Fabulous. And um, it gives me a great deal of pride to have the privilege to lead an organization that, that thinks that way. That's fabulous, and we'll be happy to have you as two Fortune 500 companies. But right. you know, there are only 500 slots. Somebody's going to have I'm to go. Little, I'm a little worried about this. <laughs> so, uh, all right. So let me ask you a difficult question here, because the SEC has decided decided a few years ago, in its wisdom, that it would be a good thing to publish the ratio of the CEO's salary to the average employee's salary. Yep. In that ratio. You, depending on your perspective, you either look great or you don't look too good. <laughs> You're sort of top 10-ish. You had to go there on this one, didn't I you? Just... Thanks so much. <laughs> but I, but I want to know how- such a nice guy. No. I, 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 it, it obviously hasn't escaped the attention of your employees, so you must have to deal with this. How do you explain it? How do you deal with it? Yeah, so I, um, I have an office, but I spend, we have a, a corporate cafeteria, a corporate cafe in the building, and I spend most of my day sitting at a table there having my meetings there, and it gives people an opportunity. To, first of all, I'm not trapped in an office, but I can talk to people. And I've had more than one person sit down after that came out and just say, I don't, I don't understand what it means. Can you tell me what it means? And what I've really explained is that it's a ratio that, that is relevant, but that for us, where it's calculated against the population of a huge number of part-time seasonal employees that we have in our stores, um, that it's not probably as meaningful as it otherwise would be at the end of the day. Um, I don't know what one does with these at the end of the day. I can assure you that um, I, I don't feel nearly as good as it makes me look, if you want to think about it. I'm living <laughs> large right now. Um, and it's, but it, it has introduced a conversation, I think, that's probably healthy at the end of the day. Well, let's, let's forget the top part of the ratio and just focus on the bottom part. Yep. How do you think about fair wages, fair pay for your workers? Yeah, is so it what moved, the market will bear or is it something else? My, the CEO before me moved quite early to up our wage schedule for our retail employees. 
and we pushed it up over two progressive tranches. Those were the minimums. Those are well above minimum wages. Um, we have a big initiative now in the company, um, and it has different labels in the brands. What it's really around is uh, fewer part-time employees in our stores, and therefore the employees that are in our stores have many have more benefits. hours. Many more hours and benefits. Um, and that, again, yields, what does it yield? It yields people who are much more committed to it. It yields um, a real job versus you know, four or six hours a week or something like that. And it has people in our stores who are there every day, who know our customers by name, literally. Um, and to me, that's an important direction that I think a lot of retailers are gonna need to be looking at. And we're, we're really moving pretty aggressively in that yeah. direction. Yeah. Um, and it's not just being driven by the fact that we're in tight labor markets and it's hard to get people and it's therefore not, you have to pay more. It's not, you know, there's, there's a lot about that. I saw more statistics today. Um, we have a seasonal peak that starts in October. We were staffed in early October last year to our seasonal peak for our employees. The same is true in our distribution centers. We do let our wages reflect local market as opposed to a national mm -hmm. average or something like that. And so in a market like San Francisco or, or New York, we'll be paying well above what we'd be paying someplace else that's a lower wage environment. Yep. So you have a lot of people out here who want to follow the path that you've followed. I'm gonna open it up for questions in just a minute, but before I do that, What's the advice you would give them uh, to get to the right place in this shared value journey? What's the advice that I would give them? I mean, to me, the, the single most important thing, it goes back to this issue that it cannot start as doing good. It cannot start as philanthropy. It has to be threaded into what matters to your employees, what matters to your economics, and what matters to your customers. And I really believe that. The first one we kicked off in this company was Product Red, which some of you may recall was Bobby Schreiber and Bono's um, stitched a number of com companies together to raise money to fight HIV, AIDS in Africa. Mm -hmm. And that was fundamentally premised on the notion that philanthropy um, is episodic, uh, but if it's baked into the economics of your business, and it is good for the business, it will thrive and it will survive. And um, it's easy to say, it is not easy to do, but it is essential at the end of the day, or we won't make real change in this area. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna open it up to people who have questions. I have a lot more, but there, I assume. Be brave. It's the last session of the day, you can tell, huh? Uh, well, let, let me ask you, uh, one of the things I find when I talk to CEOs about this, one of the things that has, and I do believe, and I'll talk about this in a minute, I do believe this movement, I mean, you guys, uh, a, a, um, FSG has been at it now for over a decade, many of you been, have been at it over a decade, I do believe the movement is growing. I, I, and I say that as somebody who spends a lot of time talking to CEOs. One reason it's growing is because of a sense that the political system is failing us. And so the things that we used to think, that's not my problem, that's the government's problem, you realize the government isn't gonna deal with it, whether it's, whether it's healthcare or training or whatever. Is that part of what you see going on? You know, somebody asked me a while back, what's the biggest surprise you've had as CEO? And the biggest surprise I've had as CEO is the need to use the company's voice, my voice, the power of this position, to participate in a social and political conversation in a way that companies traditionally haven't been in. Um, we've seen that, um, I don't know what one calls it, an absence of leadership, occasionally toxic leadership in places these days. And I do believe that it's become a responsibility for a company and a CEO to really thread the eye of the needle, because that's yeah. what it is, which is if there is an issue where my employees feel threatened or a community I do business in feels threatened or jeopardized, I do believe it's important to add our voice and to not be quiet. On the other hand, I have an obligation of my shareholders not to have a picket line outside in front of an old Navy store from one, one segment of the political spectrum or another at the end of the day. But, but that, is a, that is a very hard needle to thread. I mean, I, I agree with you completely as somebody who's been watching this for three or four decades. The kinds of things that have happened in the last five years where you have uh, 
a bunch of business people led by Mark Benioff speaking out against the religious liberties law in Indiana, or you have Bank of America opposing its own state government for passing a law limiting transgender access to public bathrooms, or, or you have Delta Airlines uh, withdrawing its discount program for the yeah. NRA in a state where its legislature is composed majority of members of the NRA. Those are the kinds of things that never would have happened 10 or 15 never. years ago. And so how, and there's so many of them. I mean, there's an event that Charlottesville, what, what Ken Frazier uh, of Merck did after Charlottesville. How, it's not, the old rule was, if it doesn't directly affect my bottom line, I'm getting under the desk and I don't want to have anything to do with this controversy, right? That is true. What is the new rule? The new rule is number one, pick your shots. You can't rise to all the opportunities that are out there and use your voice every place. Number two, and this is super important for me, is I listen deeply to the employees inside the company. Um, and there are times when I'm going to say, somebody will ask me, there was whatever it is, why did, why did we not say something then and we said something here? And I will say that those two things. I use my voice and secondly, I'm listening. And, um, but it is important. I, I do believe that if you are quiet in many of these instances, you are complicit at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, and I also uh, talked to my board a lot about it as well. This is a topic in the boardroom. Yeah. I can't imagine this was a topic in the boardroom even five years ago. And my board needs to know that there are times when I'm going to hang the company out there pretty far and potentially take a risk because it is important to do. To set values, to set directions for? To communicate the clear values of the organization, what we stand for internally, what we stand for in the community, and to stand up in support of our customers and our employees. Absolutely I, essential. I, I have another theory, and this comes from my okay. years as an observer, not a participant. I've only been a participant for two months, uh, but I've been an observer for, for four decades. That the, that the nature of corporate leadership has fundamentally changed in part because of the pace of change. You know, if you go back to the to the uh, last, you know, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, corporations were kind of information hierarchies. All the information went up to the top, the CEO put together a strategy, and then he put to, gave the marching orders, and the marching orders went back down. Ah, oh, for those days, huh? It doesn't work <laughs> that way anymore, right? It's, first of all, it takes too long. Second, information goes everywhere all at once. And so the fundamental nature of your job has changed in profound ways. It's been like this since I came in, but I did have a conversation with the previous CEO of the company who looked at me across the table over breakfast and said, your job's way harder than mine was 20 years ago. <laughs> um, way harder in some ways. Um, I think you're much better informed today because information is much more fluid at the end of the day. I think the content is just fundamentally different. And think about your job as well. You used to be get a magazine out and get it on the newsstand, I assume. And today, you're reaching your consumer through multiple channels, multiple formats. Um, you're balancing all of those needs at the end of the day. You're synchronizing messages across uh, asynchronous and very dissimilar platforms. The same is really true for a retailer. We touch our customers through so many touch points. It used to be we took out a, a print ad in a fashion magazine. Oh, for those days. Oh, for those <laughs> days. Yep. Questions? Yes, right here. Yeah, thank you for your presentation. Um, your new CEO of uh, Old Navy, Sonia Single, if she was here, uh, what would she tell us about her shared value journey? About, sorry? Her, her shared, shared value, value journey. journey. So Old Navy is um, highly aligned with the, if you think about Old Navy inside the company, I'm assuming Old Navy as, as part, of, uh, part of Gap Inc., highly aligned with everything that we have done. Um, we have talked a great deal, and as I've talked around the company, and I've talked to employees about what's going to change. One of the things I say is not our values. And she and I are highly aligned from that standpoint. They will find their values over time and how they support and connect to the community. For them, their big piece of this way ahead is that they are a strong advocate of the Boys and Girls Club. And she is on the Boys and Girls Club board, which is a big component of our This Way Ahead program. Um, but I think she would be, um, it would be indis largely indistinguishable uh, in terms of what she is saying where Old Navy is today versus the company. But then spoken through the lens of a woman who was born in India, raised in Canada, and now an American citizen who's had a very different, uh, very different cultural journey at the end of the day. So it's going to be, I think, really interesting to see 
what her spin and her leadership ultimately does with Old Navy as they, as they start to move independently. Others, right here. Thank you. Uh, I'm Norwegian, so I have a more Scandinavian-related question. Uh, because what we see in the Scandinavian country, big companies like uh, IKEA and others that are highly consumer-driven, but also um, the consumers or what they sell, uh, like you're selling some of your products, that uh, consumer are getting more um, aware of how many times they buy something, uh, if how long can they last, uh, and young people, especially within clothing, they are uh, actually either buying some really expensive clothes and going on secondhand, as you're buying secondhand clothes, yep. and the totally different uh, behavior of the consumers. Uh, what do you think about that in the future here with your brands? So there's a, I think it's, it is super important, and it's super important on two different two different paths. Um, and let me just, I'm gonna spend a minute, I'm probably gonna take too long on this. Number one, um, clothing grows, clothing, the global apparel market has grown in the low to mid single digits forever. Over the last 30 years, all new demand in global apparel has come from synthetic fiber production. So the production of sustainable fibers has remained flat. A lot of that has come out of what is known as fast fashion and is largely cheap clothing that is very disposable. Um, it wasn't in Norway, but it was in Sweden where a very large global fast fashion company overbought and fed product into the electrical generation facilities in the city in which they do business. That is profound waste in my view. Mm -hmm. Um, we do see this in our business. In each of our brands, we are focused on um, really continuing to increase our quality with the underlying message being buy more that lasts, buy less that lasts longer. Um, the second thing is that there is a, a dirty secret in all of, all of textiles and apparel. Uh, when, when you walk into a clearance section or a markdown room in a store, what you're seeing is product that was misbought and is being sold oftentimes below cost. If you think about a poly blouse that started as in an oil well, was extruded into fiber, went to India to be woven into fabric, went to Vietnam to be cut and sewed and dyed, got packaged and shipped, went into a DC, got shipped into a store to then be sold at below cost, there's an immense sustainability impact in the long tail of product badly purchased, badly bought, overbought, that this industry needs to continue to, to wrestle with. And again, if I go back to shared value, if I think about buying right, buying right is margin accretive and waste reducing. And so it, especially in this new Gap Inc. that we're creating, um, buying right and waste reducing is going to become a key tenet of how we do business. Hmm. Um, and then you ask about the resale market. I think it's very interesting at the end of the day. And this is one where I will be honest, I have to suspend my own personal preferences because I don't want to wear somebody else's clothing, but I do believe it's a very interesting market in certain segments of the business and it's something that we're looking very carefully at. Really? So you may be going into it? I think there are places where reselling is a very interesting opportunity, yeah. Interesting, you made some news but today. But I did not <laughs> make a commitment. I said we were looking very carefully at it, Alan. Make sure that when you tweet this out, you get it right. I have one last question for you. Yes, sir. Those socks, are they from The Gap? See, the thing, um, they're not. Because Oh, really? They're okay, because they I was gonna go. They were a gift to me. <laughs> Here's the deal though, you're not wearing a tie, I'm not wearing a tie. Yeah. Back in the day, tie used to be how you expressed your individuality. I'm not wearing a tie, so you gotta, yeah, see right there. Now, oh, well, there's, yep. there's a message there. I think the gap needs to up its sock game. Uh, Art Pack, thank you very much. Thank Great you so much, really appreciate it, thanks a lot.